and hello, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. And our topic today, the erasure of black women from history, how and when that has happened. We are so pleased today to have as our guest, Dr. Janet Deward Bell, author, social justice advocate, and communications strategist, that's a big title, and she does it really well, <laughs> who has done extensive research on the women of the civil rights movement and why we know so little about them. Thanks, Janet, for being here today. And, and we, of course, know each other from uh, always been a huge fan of yours and the, and the work that you, that you do. Um, what, what's happened to the women in the civil rights or women, period, how they get erased from history? Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me into your community. I think that you really have a fabulous town square for people to talk about the various aspects of black America. But in terms, sure. in terms of the women, it's the, the, obviously there's that intersectionality between race and gender. So they're, again, with, in the larger society, as women, they were ignored within the various black communities. And I try not to say black community as one singular thing they often were fighting for a place, but the women themselves were so busy, I say, doing the work that they did not necessarily seek the recognition and they were not able to write it down, to put it down so that it was memorialized. I, you know, I think about the uh, Alexander Hamilton, which is all New Yorkers are, are fixated with that. The whole world, and right, fixated. Yes. Eliza yeah. Hamilton lived 50 years after he was killed in the duel, and she was able to tell, her st tell his story. So who tells the story of the women in the civil rights movement? There's some great scholars. I shy when I call myself a scholar, shy away a little bit because they're great scholars like Beverly Guy Sheftel, Barbara Ransby, uh, uh, um, Darlene Clark Hines, you know, they're people who really have mm -hmm. done so much to lift up and to talk about the women in history, but even all of that is not enough. Right. And so shows like this and people talking about it and writing books about it, and, and that's how we're going to recapture the history and also recapture some of the lessons that we've already learned and seem to have to relearn Time over and, and time over, again. over and over again. And this is the subject of your dissertation for your doctorate yes. that I'm so excited to know will be a book out yes, the next year. Be. And I love the title, Lighting the Fires of Freedom. Yes, because that is exactly what the women did. It wasn't just a big bang that all of a sudden you had this civil, civil rights movement. There was groundwork that had been laid over many decades and years. Women, black women in particular, particularly in the women's club movement, that's one, that's one aspect mm -hmm. of it, National Council of Negro Women at the black colleges. These women were ready. How did, they, how did the bus boycott succeed? How did people get to work? Why? Because the women, Joanne Williams and others, who start, uh, they started early to come up with alternate means of transportation, how to get those flyers out. We did not have the internet then. You couldn't, you couldn't just email someone. Right. How did you get the word out to people? So people had thought far in advance. They were visionaries and, and they, they worked together as a community of engaged people to how are we going to look forward to freedom. So these women were lighting the fires for a long time. Yeah, in your whole definition of leadership, and you do a lot of leadership training and are, mm -hmm. you know, very, very good at, good at that, you, you talk about several kinds of leadership, uh, they're the activist, the advocate, the, you know, but, but are, and the servant, right, which mm -hmm. is an interesting, servant leader. Uh, the servant leader, an interesting mm -hmm. concept, because many people would think that that's, a lot of the women fit in that category, but you said Martin Luther King also was in that category of servant leader. Yes, it's not servile, it's someone who sort of, who really understands that their role is to help other people, that they, that they, that their value, that they, that they really uh, have is really one of community and lifting up the community. And so Martin Luther King, as with many ministers, are called, you know, in, in, in religion you are called to serve. <laughs> yes. So Martin Luther King right. was really called to serve. Rosa Parks, who had started an organization earlier to, that was one of the backgrounds, uh, backbones of, of the movement was a supporter. She was the NAACP secretary, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And 
speaking of titles, secretary was not someone who just sat around taking notes and things like that. The NAACP secretaries were people who investigated. Mm -hmm. um, Merle Evers was secretary to her husband, Medgar Evers. She was, besides being an absolute partner with him in the NAACP, Medgar Evers being the first field secretary in Mississippi who unfortunately was assassinated in their driveway. Merle Evers was his partner in all things. I want to talk a little bit more about yes. her, but first I want to talk a little bit about you now in terms of, I always ask the guests to place him or herself in black America. Where, where do we find you? What were your earliest influences? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania. My mother grew up in a small town outside, uh, 100 miles from Little Rock, Arkansas. My dad grew up in a small uh, farming town outside of Atlanta. So I have really southern roots. My mother always believed in education because she didn't get an education. She went to eighth grade. My father went to third grade because all the black children were taken out for uh, agriculture, picking cotton, things like that. But my mother always had this fierce notion about freedom. And she was my first leadership model. Her mother was a leadership model. My grandmother was fierce. <laughs> and she had three daughters, my mother being the youngest one, and she really protected them. In those days, um, insurance people would come around and they were all white and they would, t on a weekly basis, to get the insurance in the country. And one day, one guy who apparently didn't get the word, you did not mess with Miss Sophronia's daughters, made a uh, pass, actually fondled one of my, uh. one of my aunts. Mm. And my grandmother, who was four foot eight or four foot eleven, we were, we were still trying to figure out exactly how, how tall, tall she, how tall she was because well, she was eight, really 11, right. ten feet tall. Right, right. Quietly goes over, picks up a shotgun, uh. and she does it. She aims it, and she gets about this close to the young man's ear. Well, he had a good, the good sense to leave. Huh. So my grandmother, my grandparents, sent their daughters away because I figured certainly they're going to be killed. They're going to be lynched or something. And they sent them, but they, they were going to stand their ground. They refused to move. So this is the kind of stock I feel I come up and that I have to uphold. So after about two weeks, nothing happened. And they're like, okay, this is interesting. After two weeks, another insurance man comes. He goes, Miss Sophronia? And as if nothing had ever happened. So that's the kind of courage, mm -hmm. the kind of sense of purpose that I feel that I have to live up to. That's my goal every day, to honor their sacrifices, to honor their bravery. So in Erie, Pennsylvania, my family lived on, essentially uh, integrated the county schools. My oldest brother, who's five years older than I was, was the first known black student. Right. Because some of us were passing there. Right. right. Known sure. black student right. at the school. In my graduating class of about 1,300, I was one of two black students. Mm. So that was part of it. But I was also the president of the youth NAACP when I was 12. Right. So I've had this civil rights notion for many, many years. It's, 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 it's in my DNA. Sure. So, so your mother went as far as the eighth grade, your yes. dad as far as the third grade. Yes. Here you are with your doctorate. And I know that you lived a high powered educational career, life, you know. Uh, how did that happen? I know that she believed in education, but believing it and making it happen in your children is not always the same thing. My mother was also one of the smartest people ever. The fact that she did not get the chance to share her gifts with the broader community is really a tragedy. And there are a lot of mothers like, like mine, but my mother was a leader in our community. She was always helping people. She was, she was one of the kindest people Ever. And she believed fiercely that education was the foundation for freedom. And she also, it, it's funny, my nieces and nephews, what they remember about my mother mm -hmm. is that when they would say to her, well, how do you spell so-and-so, what's the word? She would say, look it up. <laughs> and so to this... Or now it would be Google it, right? right but they would still look it up. Yeah. But that's the, so one of my nieces is a professor and another one is a, is a principal. So they all, so they talk about, they, they had to look it up. You couldn't just go to her and say, well, what is that? Right. Well, you, had to, you had to have some sort of energy and involvement in learning that's the fine. answer yourself. That's how you learned independence. That's how you gained your own wings. And she was, she believed in doing that. 
So now you, you made your way to New York. How, yeah. how was that? How did you get here? John Jacob, National Urban League. I, used, I lived in Washington where I was the producer for at the CBS affiliate, mm -hmm. one of the first black television shows in 1969. We, ah. we called ourselves the Riot Babies. I was a producer for Rambe. Uh huh. And right, right. Yes, and had a lot of wonderful people on that show who really continued my education in terms of informing me about the black community. And I was a member, a youth member of the Washington Urban League board. When John Jacob became president of the National Urban League, after a few years, the director of communications retired and they didn't have anyone to edit the state of black America. And I tell the story, Mr. Jacob denies this. They're sitting around saying, now what idiot can we get to come at the last minute to edit a book in less, three months, in less than three months? So he thought, oh, I'll get Janet Dewart. Right. So I came to New York in 1987 to stay for one year and Hmm. It's been a little bit longer than that. It has been, and in the in the process, married a wonderful man. Yes, I, I I met Derek Bell because I called him up to submit an article for the State of Black America, and to my shame, I didn't know who he was. Like probably the most important black lawyer I professor know. in the world, right? It, or, oh, yes, or and not even black, any of any color. Right, so Derek Belt, uh, for, for those of, the, of you who may not know, it was such a principled man that he left Harvard because Harvard was not Would not giving, hire, would not tenure a right. woman of color. Right. And Derek was the first black tenured professor at Harvard Law School after all those years. He got tenure in 1960, in 1971. He started teaching in 1969. He got tenure two years later. And his first wife, who died before Derek and I met, Jewel Bell, I always lift her up and give her the praise because after two years, Harvard said to Derek, they were going to, they were going to back out on their deal. They said, well, you need to teach another year, you know, there's, there's some question, blah, blah, blah. Because my husband, besides being brilliant, had only handled 300 school desegregation cases and had worked with Constance Baker Motley and Robert <laughs> Carter and all those people, Thurgood Marshall. Right, right. I mean, how incompetent can you be? So at any rate, Harvard came up with this thing, well, we want to give you another trial year. You're familiar with that, right? These sure, trial periods sure. for black people. Jewel Bell said, no, you kept your end of the bargain. Harvard will keep theirs. And she was so adamant that Derek went and said, two years up, you either, either tenure me tenure me or not. And that's how he gained it. And the students loved it. He came there, speaking of leadership, it was the student leaders, not only the black students, but the students leader who said, we, re we want diversity. This world is changing. We don't want to just be taught by white men. Mm. And so they, Derek really saw his move when he was leading the diversity protest as supporting the students. Well, one of my all-time heroes, and we'll talk at the end because Great you continue, man. continue his lecture series and, and uh, do so much, and have your own scholarship uh, fund, by the way, which I, I do. Which I think is terrific. At now, Baruch let, College. At Baruch College. Let's let's go through some of the women of the civil rights uh, movement. Love to. That that you think were great le leaders. You talk a little bit about Merle Evers. Let's go back to her, and and tell tell me what was special about her way of leading. First of all, each of the women I interviewed was, it was entitled is entitled to a book or two oh, by themselves. Right. They're, they're, they're just fabulous. But Merle Evers. Besides having the sense of partnership, but the, to be able to, I, I asked her how she coped when her husband was killed essentially in front of her and her children. And she told me that she played it out in her mind because she knew it was that the times were dangerous. What would happen if? And so she, it was not that she was fearless. She knew how to cope with fear. And Merle Evers, after she stayed in that house for a year and a half or so and then realized that she needed to take her three children to California, where she went, where she went back to school and got and earned her own degree. She is a woman who absolutely uh, knows how to work in partnership, knows how to stand on her own, and she is so supportive of the black community. So she's, to me, she, she is my single biggest role model. Derek said to me, he said, I want you to be like Merle Evers. <laughs> and I told her that, and yes. Mrs. Evers said, 
Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> but continue to be, to be uh, active in the NAACP and... Uh, and not totally appreciated. Her, right. her leadership was supported by her then husband, or her second husband. And so, um, but she, the, the organization has evolved somewhat, but not entirely. Yes. So Merle Ever, in some ways, it's just, she's a little prickly sometimes. And I love that because she says, and some of the other women also intimated, we're not muse museum pieces, we are real people. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I think to know their full complexities is really even more important to know their, than to know their iconic status. Right, well, Kathleen Cleaver, I oh, told I you. Oh, I love her. I know, so do I. I. I met her for the first time recently, but certainly had covered her as a reporter when she was with the Black Panthers. Now she's a grandmother and is teaching, as she's a law professor. Uh, and uh, as we all, we sat there and talked about our grandchildren, I thought, what an arc of, you know, how, how times have changed. <laughs> on the run from the FBI, oh right, on most wanted right. list. But she came back, she graduated, undergraduate, summa cum laude. Yes. Uh, she, she clerked for Judge Leon Higginbottom. Brilliant. She's one of the smartest people ever. And she just, she still has that fire in, in her. And it's interesting, a couple of the other women I interviewed said, they said to me, is she still as beautiful as she was? And I said, yes, she is. She is, she is, but, but more than that. Now she, I would say that in, in terms of her leadership value, it was the reinvention of her life. I mean, it could have ended with the Black Panther episode, period. We never would have heard about her again. And she invented or became herself who she was intended to be. But she also reached back to her own leadership model, who was her brilliant mother. I think her mother graduated from college in, in, in her teens. Her mother, her mother's brilliant. Her father was. They grew up in a, 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 a almost a black protected community, a cocoon. So she she had this ground, this grounding of community and of self. Mm -hmm. So as many of us did in the 60s or 70s, we had certain kinds of uh, zigzag movements and certain kinds of arcs. But Kathleen had the besides her own wonderful brilliance and her own sense of um, sense of self. She has a sense of adventure. She also ha she's really has self-knowledge in the sense that she knows how valuable she is mm. to this world and she's also dedicated to her grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> right, of course, as we know that. What about Diane Nash? Diane Nash is, is, is absolutely, uh, she's, she's amazing. She said to me, when she, I tracked her down. She was one of the hardest interviews I ever had. And she said, I'm only talking to you because Ivanhoe Donaldson told me to. <laughs> and Ivanhoe Donaldson was considered, I called him the strategist of, uh, of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He died earlier this year. But Diane Nash was played in the movie Selma. Mm -hmm. And speaking of how the erasure of women from history, they had this pretty uh, actress playing Diane Nash, who's still gorgeous and 70-something, right? And this young woman in the film is sitting on a desk and she's listening to the guys planning oh, right, the march and right. stuff like that. And I'm sitting... That was, made me a little... <laughs> I was in the theater and I'm trying to hold myself down right. and not scream. I thought, this woman is a strategist. Right. She was the leader of the Nashville student movement. Why are, have they diminished her so? And I've asked other people if they noticed her in the film and they remember this pretty woman on the desk but they didn't know the history of Diane Nash. Before the, the Freedom Ride, she had, her, she had everybody side, make out wills because it was that dangerous. And so when, when, this, when the government, the United States government, tried to talk the students out of doing the Freedom Ride, she said, you don't understand, we made our wills out last week. We're ready. Wow. We're ready, we're ready. I said, ooh. That's, that's <laughs> final preparation, right? right. And, and, and competence, that's, that's a word she always <laughs> talks about. We have to be competent, we have to be intentional, we have to think about what it is we need to do to march on that road well, to hopefully freedom. when your book comes out, she'll get her full due, you know. She won't be swinging her legs, sitting on a desk, you know, listening cutely oh. to the guys, right? <laughs> Horrifying. What about Gay McDougal? Gay McDougal became, was the first black student to integrate Agnes Scott College outside of Atlanta. She was the only one. Mm -hmm. And she was there for two years until she transferred to, a, to, a, to another school. But can you imagine being the 
only one in that environment. But Gay later became very involved in, in human rights and the anti-apartheid movement. So she, she really organized that and that's part of the, and that's how she met her, her late husband, John Payton, doing, mm -hmm. doing that. Mm -hmm. But Gay McDougall is a, um, I think she's, I know she's very involved with United Nations activities and what have you. And she's, and she's a professor as well now. Right. Leah Chase. Leah Chase. Over now you see, these are all names that should be held up high. They lit the fires. <laughs> they, they did. And, and, we, and we don't know about them as, as much as we should. So, I think the people who follow the James Beard Foundation for Cooking probably know her more than most other, other people. Over 90 years old, she's still cooking at the family restaurant that was started by her late husband, Dookie Chase. That's the name uh, of, sure. the, of the restaurant. Right. But what they did against all of the anti-miscegenation laws, they hosted civil rights workers, that means black, white, uh, you know, the, and, and in their restaurant. They could have been arrested. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they were not because of the um, respect that the community had for the Chase family because they were not, they were not considered to be wild-eyed and what have you. So right. people, people paid attention to what they did, but Mrs. Chase also supported the student movement, and, she, and one of the things she, she said she regretted it, that she didn't support them more. She said, we should have listened to these young people. Okay, now Gloria Richardson. Gloria Richardson of the Cambridge Movement in Maryland was considered, I think Jet Magazine called her the Lady General of the Civil Rights Movement because she was one of the first people who said, I'm not quite sure about this nonviolent thing. And um, she was, that was quite controversial, not only within the movement, but outside of the movement. And there's this great picture of her with uh, the National Guard having their rifles like that, and she's face to face. She was just astounded that anyone would point a gun at her, and she just refused to turn away. Another movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she's still alive. She right. left Cambridge, Maryland. She came up to New York. She mm -hmm. was working in the, the social workers uh, union, Local 371. She's a, a labor person. <laughs> that's, that's great. Now, Dr. June Jackson. Christmas. Oh, my so, goodness. Who's psychiatrist who yes. started the community uh, clinics for because there, there weren't black people that were doing that. But one of the things that she and her husband did you know, I keep saying late husband, Walter Christmas. They had, he was a journalist, by the way. Right, yes, yeah, sure. And um, sure. they would host people from the South, particularly students, they would open their home to give them rest, rest periods, rest and restoration you know, periods at their home. And she never really worked in the South, but she was like many people. See, there's some people who think, like some New Yorkers, if you weren't born, weren't born in New York, you're really not a New Yorker. There's some people who think, if you really didn't spend 1964 in Mississippi, you really weren't a civil rights worker. You didn't really support, <laughs> right, we're right, really not precisely. a part of the civil rights movement. And we, it, we miss that, those people's contributions when they are supporting, they're raising money, they're bringing people up, you're, they're hosting people like Stokely Carmichael who became Sekou mm -hmm. you know, things, things like that. So uh, she, she was also my pilot interview. She was so kind to me that she really helped me uh, she helped fortify me to go forth and inter to interview all these other people. So talk to me about uh, the, the toughness of uh, staying in history, staying in the present, um, because, you know, our friend Gloria Steinem always says, and the reason that people have to be, and you're on the Women's Media Center board, right? If people, the reason women have to be in the day-to-day -day stories of what's going on is because if they're not there, they won't be in the history books either, you know. And Dorothy Height was one of the examples mm -hmm. of being excluded uh, because of her sex and her race, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody, she fell into that, you know, no woman's land uh, <laughs> where uh, it was hard for her to get traction for all the amazing things that she did. Yes, even though she was considered one of the, along, one of the big six along with various men who, who got the credit exactly. for the March on Washington. And, um, but Gloria, of course, is right. And we see that playing out a little bit with the women of Black Lives Matter. Right, we, precisely. We, we talked about that because they're, they, they, all of a sudden they're giving the credit to the men. Excuse me, <laughs> these women were as instrumental, if not more so, in the foundation of the movement and keep it, keeping it going. So you, you really have to write about and talk about Sherilyn Eiffel, 
who is the president and a general counsel, I hope they have that title right, a legal, a legal defense, defense fund, fund right. was the Derrick Bell lecturer last year. And she talks about that you have to, she says similar things to what Gloria says, that someone has to tell the story. And so often, and it's not just in terms of black people, our, our society is one, ancient history is five years ago. Right. So, so we have to really right. talk about not only what was done, but what that, that impact and what the import is for now. And so that's a constant thing to, to have to do. Right, and to make sure, because when, you know, the, this fancy magazine, you know, gave the credit for Black Lives, Ma Lives Matter to a guy. Oh, of give course. Him, give him the credit due him. That's right. But didn't mention the women at all who mm -hmm. started the, or this, uh, this whole movement. It's like a lot of people began to, to say it's happening already, you know, that the women are being erased. Um, I always ask my guests, I'm going to ask it here of you uh, towards the end, uh, to finish the statement, the power, the strength of black America lies in. How would you complete that statement? Resilience, but a kind of defiant resilience. I think so, too often we, we get uh, caricatured as being one thing, either being meek and mild or being militant. There's, there's no... Uh, there's no appreciation, a little appreciation of the depth of complexity at, and the diversity within the black community. But I think that it's our, it, it, there's one, that we share certain things in common. The women, the, the women leaders I interviewed share, I reduce it to two, three words, which certainly did not capture everything, but the authenticity, the courage, the purpose. But it all, it's a kind of defiance that they refuse to be invisible, they refuse to be ignored, and they maintain their joy in the Doing face of it. struggle. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much for that. That sums it up beautifully, Janet Dewart Bell, for being here with us today. Well, thank and you. so many thanks to you all out there for watching. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. And we will see you the next time. And you have to come back.